Okay, let's do this. Hello, the world of you. Welcome to the hashtag Ask Demo show for another edition where you ask the questions and I will do my best to answer them uh, with the questions that I have not seen. So fingers crossed that I can answer them. Um, otherwise, it'll be a shit show. So, uh, but have we got any? We've got any post? We've got any post? Um, yes, we have. We've got some post. Look at this. <laughs> so. Everyone who knows me knows that I like post um, and I like stuff and, I, and people are starting to send stuff in and every week I ask for more stuff for the wall and as you can see from last week, uh, Mithra, who very kindly sent in this amazing picture, uh, is now on the wall. Emnibus, which you did that. Yeah, that took a long time. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> such a great sticker, really so that's cool. fair forever. Oh, we forgot our Name That Film, uh, which we do every week. We should um, have a think, have a think about what we can do for Name That Film and then we'll... Uh, We'll put something in, but let's see what this is. So, whoever sent this in, ah, oh, thanks very much. Oh, I just did rip half the stuff <laughs> in half. Uh, very exciting. Oh, look at that. Oh, I love, I love stuff. Oh, look at this. Oh, it's Furion. Oh, this is cool. Look, I can get VIP wristbands. Oh, that is very exciting. CDs. This is going up on a wall. Don't. I'm going to put this somewhere. Maybe we'll stick these here. I think that will go there, which is very good. Badges, I do love badges. Ah, and a letter which I will read, um, but I know this is from, the guys are awesome. And stickers, so I'm gonna put some stickers around as well. So Furion, I'll put a link down below. Thank you so much, and I absolutely will be wearing t-shirts. Uh, t-shirts, by the way, you are more than welcome to send me because I do wear them and I will wear them on camera. Um, so, amazing, thank you very much. I am tend to be small or medium, whichever you feel like sending, but, oh look at those two t-shirts. I love t-shirts, amazing. <laughs> Dudes, thank you so much. Link down below, we will get this stuff on the wall. You will be immortalized forever. Uh, and if you wanna send some stuff in, I will also put the address in, but feel free to send in merch, send in stuff that you wanna see on the walls to promote your band. That's what we are here to do. So, questions, let's get on with the show. Okay, um, how much of a big deal are launch parties? I'm looking to finish my album in summer when I go home from college. Should I wait and delay or not have one? Courtney asking. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think it depends what you're trying to achieve with launch, launch parties. Did you just say something about summer? She's going... Um, yeah, so she's, she's going to finish on. her album in the summer, but she's home at that point, so she's saying, should I wait till after the summer? I think it's a dude, but... Oh, sorry, King. That's all right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it depends what you want to achieve with a launch party. I mean, launch parties can be brilliant because it's a chance to get everyone together and... Uh, and, and get everyone in one room and say, buy my album, and everyone knows why they're there. Buy my single or buy my album or, or whatever message that you want to get across. Are they crucial? No, not really. And it all depends on, on again, what, um, what you want people to do because not all bands, um, I happen to know, uh, this, we've, we've had conversations before with the types of music it is, and I happen to know that it's not a big, massive, uh, a big, massive sh sort of show type thing. Um, there's no rules for this. I mean, when it comes to, to album launch parties, um, I think they are worth doing because it's just an excuse to say, look, we're having a big celebration. We're having a big party. I'm going to get all my mates down. I'm going to invite the fan base down. And while we're there, I'm going to say, look, you all come down. We're all here for the same thing. Please download our single. And you can even have a countdown. You can be very creative with it. And it's an excuse to actually, you know, I, I constantly talk about when you're doing gigs, give people a reason to come down to your show. Well, this is a really good reason. Rather than just come to our gig, come to our gig. It's like, hang on, we're going to, we're going to release this album and we're going to be playing tracks off it. Um, and you can do some very creative, special things on it. So I, I definitely am a fan of album launch parties because it feels more of a party than a gig. Um, as for when you have them, I wouldn't suggest delaying anything for months on end whilst you're waiting for everyone to come back because that, that for me, time is more important. And, uh, and, you know, make no bones about it. When, it. when it comes to all this sort of stuff of, of, of doing gigs and albums and all that kind of stuff, nothing will 
sell your album faster than you sat down with a phone and an email and, and Facebook and you just messaging people and working one-to-one -one, very, very hard on just saying to people, please buy my, my single, please buy my album. You know, in this environment, when it comes to social media, people are constantly just telling the world and, and the world isn't listening. But in this environment, rather than me talking down this camera to you right now, if I'm here with you and I just say, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but I have got an album. And you say, oh, I didn't know that. And I just say, do me a favor, can you just buy it? I know it's like seven quid or 10 quid or whatever it is, but I would really appreciate it. All of a sudden, I'm putting you in a position where you go, yeah, like, of course I'll buy it. Yeah. You know, I've got it here actually. Have you got any money on you? I can give you some change. You know, all of a sudden, it's much more one to one. So you will get a little bit more um, momentum from having an album launch party. Yes, absolutely. But is it the be all and end all? No, not really, because at the end of the day, what it comes down to after that is the hard work. And that's the bit that bands are always scared of. That's the bit that bands don't really do very well. They're good at the pizzazz. They're good at, we've just made a new video. We've just been creative. And that's like, great, we've done the creative bit. Now comes the distribution. And that is hours and hours and hours and hours of just sitting there for weeks on end asking the same question again. Will you buy this? Or will you come to my gig? Or will you go on my social media or will you please help me with this and and that's the most important bit so do you need one no if you can have one would you have one yes because it's just an excuse to have a party and if you've got an excuse to get people to your gig it's it will help yeah okay okay cool um right so jez is asking i have currently taken over singing as well as guitar in my band as our singer left any advice for being a front man as this is daunting to me Yes, frontman is frontman is a thing that I I do. Um, I personally think I'm, without sounding egotistical, fucking great at it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but back in the day when um, when I was at BIM, my job was to compare the end of term gigs. So quite a lot of you watching this will remember back in the day when you came to BIM, and at the end of every term we'd have this big gig. There'd be 30, 30 bands, and my job would be the person that would would front in between it. Then on top of that, having my own band, the fronting is the one bit I find the most easy to do, as well as bass playing. Um, and so the tips I would give you for fronting a band is number one, prepare what you're going to say, especially if you're not confident with being a front person know exactly what you're going to say and when you're going to say it. I think that's absolutely key. And the reason for that is because I see far too many bands that the song will finish and people will start talking and having a conversation, which is a little bit like this. And when it goes through a microphone, it goes down into a lead, it goes into these big speakers, and all of a sudden it just sounds a bit mumbly and you can't really hear what you're saying and everyone's talking and there's noise and people are missing it. And you can feel the energy in the room doing this. Whereas if you walk straight on stage and you say a very, very short statement, very, very short, and you say the same thing on every single gig, which is, for example, we are Furion, let's fucking rock this shit, or you know, whatever you wanna say, people go, hmm, okay, yeah, let's do that. And, and then when it gets to the end of a song, and you, you know, I would keep the breaks very, very short so that you aren't put under pressure as a front man to just be creative or be inspirational or be funny because that's when it all goes wrong. So I would say the same thing on gig after gig after gig. And the key to that with knowing what you're gonna say is knowing who you are, which is a big thing. So I would say we are Furian. If you want to say we are from you know, Manchester, we are from Brighton, we are from London, great, but you're keeping it very, very short. And then is what message are you trying to get out? So for example, if you are uh, selling, selling an album, if you have a gig coming up next week, if you want people to join your social media, I think those are the things that you say. So you don't go down that route of saying, a funny thing happened to me the other day, because people are not there for that reason. People are there to, to listen to the music and they want that music. And I go and see bands and the singer starts to go on a bit of a story and I'm thinking, momentum's going, momentum's going. So I would much prefer to say, look, if I don't need to talk, don't talk. I would prefer the drummer to finish a song and say, look, fuck me, we've got 20 minutes in our set, so we're gonna finish the song and then I'm literally straight into the next one because the momentum will just go wooey. Whereas when it's silence, people will go to the bar, people will go to the toilet, people will start chatting and you've got, to, you've got to try and bring it back again. So only talk when you need to talk, talk in songs as opposed to in breaks. There's this, this, this need for a song to finish and then there's talking and then song starts again. Why? 
why not just have talking within a song? Literally, I always say this, but you come out on stage, that first minute, that first 30 seconds to a minute is total, it sums up your band. So if you're a rock band and you come out and you have a big riff and everyone goes, fuck, what's this? And at that point, the singer goes, we are Furion, we are gonna rock this fucking shit. Let's have a fucking great big party. And everyone goes, hooray! And then you into the song, the song ends, and then the, the drummer goes count straight in to the second song. And at that point, when the riff's playing, if the singer, the front man, wants to say something short and sweet, keep it to the point, that's, that can be done. But don't talk when you don't, when you don't need to talk. Make sure everything is statements and practice what you are going to say and say the same thing on every gig and another reason for that is because if a guitarist needs to do a guitar change for example which you know is going to take 30 seconds to a minute that's when momentum can fall so at that point you've got to keep that momentum going you're like you're like the mc like a dj that keeps keeps everything together that glues it all together so you know if you've got a minute in between a song what are you going to say don't leave it to chance so that way the momentum does go and that's when you get people like if you remember like freddie mercury doing his day and the, getting the crowd to do their thing you know little things like that you can put those in but don't leave stuff to chance because i watched too many bands do that and the momentum drops when they just start talking into a microphone so is this what you'd advise for people with stage nerves and that kind of thing as well because obviously yeah. during singing and that kind of thing too people can get really nervous before they sing would you say kind of just write everything down make it clear in your head i think so yeah because i, I think a question that you know isn't for this show but a question is do i get nervous with a lot of things because i seem very confident and um I can tell you exactly when I get nervous. I get nervous when I'm not prepared. That's the time. Like you can put a bass in my hand. I'm not gonna get nervous. I've been playing that bass for 20 years. I know exactly how to make that bass sound the way it should. However, you put me on stage with an acoustic guitar, which I'm not particularly very good at, and, uh, and having learned a song, not particularly very well and put a crowd in front of me and I'm thinking, I feel underprepared. That's where my nerves are gonna kick in. So it's not about learning something until I can get it right. It's about learning it something until I've done it so many times that I just physically can't get it wrong. So when it comes to fronting, I would practice the fronting in a rehearsal room. I wouldn't just go onto stage and say, eh, he'll be fine. Yeah. I would literally be in a rehearsal room and I'd say to the rest of the band, I know this is weird, I get it, but I am gonna be shouting weird stuff while we sing, because I wanna practice. And I want, in a rehearsal room, to go, is everyone have a good time? Yeah. And like the rest of the band are gonna be thinking, the fuck's this guy doing? But, at and the same point, <laughs> yeah, and in the mirror, you know, the more you practice it, the more you practice it, the, the more it will feel like second nature. So yeah, practice will definitely help. I'm not saying it will take all the nerves away, but when you've said something a hundred times, you will be less nervous about saying it in front of people than the third time. Okay, so preparation is key. I think oh, so, yeah. Awesome. Um, right, so Luke is asking, says, Hi Damo, what's the best way of making money as an 18-year-old musician studying music? Um, he's also saying, thanks for what you're doing for young musicians everywhere. It's a huge help. Keep it up. Ah, cheers, Luke. Thank you very much. Nice um, okay, so... For, for young musicians of 18, I think the biggest thing is, yes, you want to make money. I get it. I totally understand. And you've probably left home. You've gone to university. You're spending money like nobody's business because, because the course fees are expensive, because you've got living fees, because you don't want to work in, in Tesco's or any other supermarket. So I understand. But one thing you also have to understand as well is, is when you are 13, 14, 15 and you are a musician, people will always go, oh my God, you're that kid, you've got that niche, oh, you're the kid that plays. As soon as you're hitting 18, 19, 20, at that point, you're not that kid anymore. All of a sudden, nobody cares about your age and all of a sudden you need to compete, which means that you need to compete with me. And I've been playing for a long time and, and I've done you know, 1,500, 2,000 gigs. So, so you, you also have to take into consideration that whilst you want to make money at it, it is a long-term thing. So we're looking at a career over a long time. So what's the, I understand the question, what's the best way of doing it? And, and you know, not can it be done because it obviously can be done. So when you're, when you're aware of, of your surroundings in, in that state where you are saying, I understand I'm young, I get it. I understand I don't have years and years of experience. And physically, you look like you don't have years experience, which is a big thing. You know, when you're, when I was 18 or 19 and I needed to make money and I was playing in covers bands, I could never get the really high-end corporate stuff or wedding stuff. And I was thinking, 
why? I feel like I'm a good musician. Why can't I do it? But I think a big part of it was because if you looked at myself and the guys I was playing with, we looked like kids. So why would a corporate, you know, a, 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 corp, a company that's going to put thousands of pounds into an event, look at some kids and just go, safe pair of hands? It's stereotype, but it's kind of true. So, so what's the best way of making money? I still feel it's going to be cutting your teeth on covers. I think you can, you know, I think when it comes to teaching, you know, people recommend teaching a lot because if, if you've learned in a structured way how to play something, then you are able to get into teaching and start to teach. I think you just have to be careful because obviously, again, same thing, going to music college, you are definitely at a point where you can teach, but people are always going to be thinking, an 18-year-old teacher, that's, 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 that's a bit weird. So the way you do it is price point which is a big thing. So when I was 18, when I was 19, you know, it band broke up, no record deal. What am I going to do? Moved to a different city, in fact, moved to a different country. How am I going to make money? Can't get any big expensive gigs. I don't know any musicians. I put a covers band together where I understood the niche, which was we're going to have to play the shit shows. That was the big thing. We are going to play the shows. And fortunately, a lot of other more experienced players aren't going to want. So therefore, at the time, we were playing social clubs, we were playing pubs, we were playing working men's clubs, we were playing anywhere that people said, oh yeah, but I don't really have much of a budget. Because I knew at the time that I didn't have the options. You know, people will always say, musicians should get paid. Well, yeah, they should, but we don't live in a world where should is a thing. You know, we don't live in a fair world. So there's enough musicians out there who are prepared to play for not much money. So therefore, if that puts you out of the game, is it fair? No. Is it gonna happen? Yeah, tough. So in order to do it, you have to be A, bloody good, and B, you have to look at things like price points. So if you are gonna go out and play pubs, number one, be good enough, and number two, price yourself at a point which is realistic to your age, your experience, and more importantly, what everyone else is doing around you. Because if there are 10 bands wanting to play at that pub, for 50 quid each, for example, if you go and say, well, we'll do it for 100 quid each, then I don't understand what, what it would be in, in the pub's interest to pay twice as much money unless you are gonna bring a shitload of people in. So I think same thing with teaching. You know, Musicians Union says you should be charging 35 quid an hour or whatever the hell it is for teaching. Yeah, okay, well, maybe you should, but at the same point, if you can't get it, then who fucking cares? It doesn't make any difference whatsoever. What this comes down to is what work you can get. And as an 18 year old, you have to realize that it is gonna take time because when you are 25 and you have been doing this for another seven years and you are looking at someone on my show saying, how am I gonna make money as an 18 year old in seven years time, you're gonna be looking at it going, fuck you, man. I've been doing this for seven years. This is hard graft, it's hard grind. It's taken me a long time to get my money up. And so it is going to take a while. So I would say, start at the bottom, work your way up. It cannot fail. If you start at the bottom and work your way up, then next year you'll make more money and have more gigs and be a better musician because of it. The following year, you'll be a better musician because of it. You'll make more money, etc., etc. until you hit your peak, you know, 30, 25, 30, 35, whatever that peak is. And all of a sudden, so many people are coming to you saying, I love what you do. I want you to come and play for me or my gig or my band. And all of a sudden, it's at that point where you can name your price. At this point, supply and demand, if no one's batting your door down, you've got to make a product which is good enough that people say, oh yeah, I quite like that, and then price it accordingly. Okay, cool. Um, so Rob is asking, um, I feel like I'm driving the band along and the rest of the band are too slow and holding the project back. How do I know when to leave or sack members? Is this ruthless and should I be more ruthless? Yeah, you absolutely should be more ruthless because this is the music industry. This is the most competitive industry outside of sport. So it is dog eat dog and you want to be loyal, absolutely. But there's too many bands. Where I come from in Swansea, there's still musicians in Swansea that I've known for years and years. We, we can still make it, man. We can still do it. I just feel like loyalty comes at a cost in the music industry and I'm not saying you shouldn't be loyal however if you get to the end of your career and it's it's gone nowhere and you've you have failed and had to get a job and it's someone else's fault then that's your fault 
that's not someone else's fault, even if they fucked up. So if you're trying to drag this along, I mean, I can tell you one thing is, with all the things that you have to do to prove yourself in the music industry right now, to really build a following, build an audience, get people to buy into you, you know, organize everything, do gigs, do tours, sell records, etc., etc. With all the things that you've got to do, that is hard enough with three, four, five people in the band literally pulling in the same direction, all literally kicking ass with, with things that they're doing every week. If one person in that band is trying to pull in the opposite direction, then that makes it very, 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 very difficult. If you've got two people in the band that are doing it, it's, it's impossible. It's like those strongman competitions where they have to pull, like they have to pull a train or they have to pull a truck. Like it's hard enough. Like don't make it harder by putting the handbrake on. Like don't, don't, just don't do it. So I would say if you're in a position where you're looking at your band members and you're thinking you are holding me back, the first thing that I would do is I would call a meeting and I would be, br I would be brutal. I don't mind being brutal, but I would say these are the words that would come out of my mouth in this situation. I call a band meeting and I would say I'm gonna fucking make this. I'm going to do this, I am going to have a career, and it is not going to stop me. You have two choices, you're coming with me or you're not coming with me. If you want to come with me, then I expect A, B and C. If you're not fussed, that's totally fine, but don't hold me back, because I have not got time. You know, in, in, in what I want to achieve, I'm already looking 10, 15, 20 years time, but I'm working every single day. If anyone's going to get in my way, they have to go. They have to. And it's horrible. But I don't want to. I don't want to say oh, I could have been a contender if it wasn't for the situation which was in my control, which I did nothing about. Your career, you're in control of it. If you are in a band right now and people are holding you back, you do have two choices: you kick their ass once, maybe twice. You give them the chance, and then you make the decision. You either sack them and keep the band going, or you leave and start something else. Control is very powerful, and. You cannot afford laziness from band members. You cannot afford it. I mean, I talked to a guy the other day who said, um, I'm in college, I've got loads of time, and the problem is, is the other three guys in my band, um, they work full time and they've got, they've got kids, and so from their point of view, they don't have the time to put in. What can I do to maximize the extra time that I've got? Well, the first thing I thought is, well, you've got a massive problem, because these three guys are literally holding you back. They can only do 20, 30, 40% of what you can do. For me personally, I would be ruthless and I'd be thinking, I have to make this, I have to work hard, and at the moment I'm dragging people with me instead of pushing the project along. So I'm, I'm got, I've got baggage holding me back, I can't have that. So do you need to be more ruthless? Unfortunately, you do, because this is the music industry. This is something, if you, if you want to just do covers for the rest of your life, if you want to be a teacher for the rest of your life, and there's nothing wrong with those things whatsoever, I've made a very successful career of doing both of those things, and you can get to a very high level of both of those things, but in originals band, in a, in a, in a band environment where you are trying to build an audience and take what you do to an audience who will buy it, then you have to be ruthless, really. Um, going back to the kind of preparation as key thing, if you were going to go about being more ruthless and having to sack members or whatever, would you suggest finding new people to work with first, having a kind of backup plan, or do you think talking to the band about it first is the most important thing? Yeah, I think, because I think of, you know, I think something that I think the audience that I have appreciate and some people don't appreciate is because I think of band as a business, to me it's the same thing. You know, I get that it's art, but you know, whether you make over in the corner these amazing amps, the person who made those amps, that's his art. But at the same point, he's got to sell them, so therefore it's a business. So a band to me is a business, unless you don't want it to be, and at that point you just say, look, I just do this because I enjoy it. Those people are fine on their own. If you do a band because you just love it and you just, you love being in a band and you love that environment, totally fine. But if you're ambitious and you want your band to go to a high level and it's not going there, wherever you want that to be, there's the issue. Now, I think if this was a business, it would be as simple as this. You're holding me back and I'm not going to be held back. So I'm giving you this warning and it's up to you. Now, at that point, if nothing's happening, I'd be probably doing both. I would be looking around for someone else. But to be honest with you, I'd probably just say, look, this isn't working, I'm gonna get rid of you and I'm gonna carry on the momentum myself because I think as soon as you start 
finding a new person saying, look, we're going to attract the guy, but at the same point, we want to get someone in first, then I think you're bringing someone else in who will always be thinking, hang on, but if you can do that to him, you can do yeah. that to me. So I think, you know, I think doing the right thing and just saying, look, we'll just cut ties. It will put us back by a couple of weeks, but we can find someone, you know, and the further forward you are, the easier it is to bring someone else in. So, so, you know, I probably would just, I'd give an ultimatum, I'd give options and then say, this isn't working. We're going to have to make a change. Out you go. Then very, very quickly look yeah. to bring someone else in. Situation, but okay, cool. Mm. That is the last of our questions. Amazing, great, fantastic. Thank you very much for watching. Um, we're going to cut this up. This is going to go on Facebook, YouTube. Uh, the whole show's on YouTube. I would very, very, very much appreciate it if you subscribe uh, to the YouTube and uh, um, I'm working on apps at the moment which tell me lots of stats about the, the, the social media we've got and I know that 50% of my YouTube um, watches are from people who subscribe, which means 50% of you guys aren't subscribed. So please, please, please subscribe. It does mean the world actually, because not only does it help the YouTube algorithm, but it brightens my day. So <laughs> if you've got a question, hashtag AskDemo. Twitter's the best way to do that. Um, but again, I'm still getting questions, Snapchat, Instagram, um, YouTube, even Facebook. I'll keep the questions, uh, I'll keep the answers coming. So thank you very much for watching and see you guys tomorrow. Peace.